would like to introduce Dr. Gerald Levy, who is uh, my good friend and colleague, and he is coming uh, to us from Duke, and he'll be talking about the coagulation system. Thank you very much. A privilege to be here. I'm going to focus on coagulation during cardiopulmonary bypass and not really talk about ECMO nor uh, any other sort of perspective. This is going to be a focus on CPB. Uh, many years ago, I trained at Mass General, and Dr. McGilvery and I had an interesting discussion because many years ago, we were still using bubble oxygenators, and Dr. Mortimer Buckley, who was one of the senior surgeons there, um, as we evolved with membranes, he still used membrane oxygenators, the mem uh, bubble oxygenators, kind of like your aquarium where you bubble oxygen into the medium where you get blood surface interfacing. Pretty impressive. Uh, and just to sort of follow up Dr. Ramsey's perspective, um, the cardiopulmonary bypass is a SIRS-like syndrome. And if you look at the inflammatory cascade, very similar to a septic-type picture. Very interesting. And many years ago, I remember Dr. Cooley telling me, he says, bypass is like sitting on a hot stove. The longer you sit, the more you burn an inflammatory response. Interesting perspective, but the evolution of circuits really has facilitated ECMO and other closed systems. Cardiopulmonary bypass is an open system with things going into the reservoir, so a bit of a different phenomenon. Just my disclosures, um, I've, in the past years, working a lot, reversing the new novel oral anticoagulants and developing purified recombinant other strategies to treat bleeding, which we'll talk about later this afternoon. So this is a simplified cascade for most of my clinician colleagues. Platelet coagulation factor activation, lots of exciting biochemistry and clot. And sometimes it's magical that we actually create clot in some of the complex coagulopathic states that we create. But a few important perspectives, extending now a little bit out of just cardiopulmonary bypass, remember that arterial clot is really platelet fibrinogen interactions. Heparin doesn't completely block this. When you're doing invasive arterial type of devices, uh, especially stents, clearly not only do we target thrombin, but we target platelets with mostly P2Y12 receptor inhibitors. Venous clot and venous thromboembolic are really inhibited by th or, or modulated through thrombin, although there's really quite complex crosstalk in the coagulation system. So the goals of anticoagulation for cardiopulmonary bypass or even off-pump surgery is to prevent clotting to allow for cannulation, initiation of um, bypass, or even for op-cab. One of the things that we don't do a great job, as I'll show you, inhibit thrombin generation during cardiopulmonary bypass. But the advantage of the heparin protamine system, one of the few systems where you actually can reverse in a safe, complete manner. And the fact that heparin binds to antithrombin in a reversible fashion allows for this to occur. So during cardiopulmonary bypass, this baby here called thrombin is what we want to inhibit. Um, and thrombin is an incredibly potent pro-inflammatory procoagulant. Stimulus activates platelets, does a lot of different things. We really try to modulate thrombin. Even extending that in septic, septic shock, DIC, in other scenarios, clearly thrombin is an important target. And again, the dosing, the heparin story, I think, for cardiac surgical practice is poorly understood by a lot of clinicians. So we start with the drug heparin. And everybody thinks heparin is one thing. It's actually a complex heterogeneous mixture of fragments that range from about 3,000 to 30,000. It's stored in the mast cells. So that's why we get it from lung. When I started, we were getting it from bovine, uh, get it from intestine. When I started, we were using bovine lung. We now use pig intestine as the therapeutic source. Um, and remember, its efficacy is through binding through antithrombin. It inhibits uh, 10A as well as thrombin, um, and the advantage is that it's reversible with protamine. So what are the potential problems of our current therapy of use of heparin? Well, despite the fact that you maintain an ACT of 400 to 480 seconds, and that varies across institutions, um, you still generate thrombin and do a multiplicity of reasons. 
Remember that antithrombin is required, and we and others have shown and targeted antithrombin for many years, that it doesn't do much in terms of if you replete it, if it decreases, but it's still required, and there are a lot of antithrombin changes that occur that I'll show you. And remember that antithrombin falls to less than 50% activity. We've shown levels as low as perhaps 20, 25% in some earlier studies. Why is this important? Well, if any of you in the room have an antithrombin level of circulating level of 50% activity, you're going to have probably a, hetero, you're a heterozygote for antithrombin deficiency, and you're going to be procoagulant. But other things occur, platelets don't work, you've got dilutional changes. So a lot of things compensate for this perspective. And there are multiple studies that really have focused on this inability to best modulate thrombin. I'm not going to go into that into detail. So one of the interesting things is uh, there's a classic study performed probably over 30 years ago by Jeff Weitz. Jeff is probably one of the hemostatic gurus on the planet out of McMaster University. And basically, one of the interesting things is that um, just to, has, what, one of the things that he showed was the critical level of heparin to best modulate thrombin. And he showed that it was about two to three units per mil. You can, can get that with the heparin protamine titration. You can get that with an anti-10A level. Also, George Despotis, um, who is a, actually co-director of the blood bank at WashU uh, and worked a lot with the cardiac surgical team, has shown that a direct correlation between heparin levels and the ability to inhibit thrombin activity as measured by a uh, activation epitope of basically fibrinogen uh, activation. Jeff Weitz's study basically showed that at a level of about two to three units per mil, as shown here, you have the ability to inhibit both fluid phase and clot phase bound thrombin. Why is this important? Well, when we were doing a protein studies back in the 90s, one of the really interesting things is that there was concern about graft patency thrombosis. And Peter Smith at Duke, when, and I was at Emory, Peter was at, at, at Duke, we showed that at a level of two to three units per mil, you decrease the risk of thrombotic sequelae. And I think this is Jeff Weitz's uh, data that showed looking at a variety of different anticoagulants. These are interesting different pieces of the puzzle that I think you have to put together um, since there's so many routine practices. And in a lot of centers, the perfusion is actually to determine how we manage anticoagulation. So um, one of the interesting things that George Despotis also showed was just looking at all the different ways to measure anticoagulation during cardiopulmonary bypass. The standard anticoagulation test we use is called an activated clotting time. A normal ACT, depending upon the assay, is about 100, 120. The older versions were maybe up to 150 seconds. Basically, you take blood and you throw dirt in it. You can throw sea light, which is diatomaceous earth, or you can throw Georgia clay kaolin in it which activates it. The unactivated is called the Lee White clotting time, which is about seven to 10 minutes. The activated ACT is 100 to 120 seconds, depending again on the assay. So what happens is if you give a bolus of heparin, the ACT drifts. But if you look at more specifically what's important, an anti-10A level, it also drifts as well, and it depends on your initial heparin dosing. One of the things that we did is two different surveys, one in 89 and then one with, um, and later, and showed that most clinicians uh, across the U.S. and North America use about a 300 to 400 unit per kilo initial heparin dosing. I think the 400 unit per kilo dosing to me makes a lot more sense because of the ability to maintain this critical heparin level. Furthermore, if you look at whole blood heparin concentration, looking at heparin protamine titration, it matches a more scientific anti-10A level. Um, and looking at temperature changes, hematocrit changes, these are the findings that occur. A lot of things affect these coagulation tests, but I think this is just a little important perspective. So in 2018, how do we monitor heparin therapy for cardiac surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass? Well, the standard of care is the activated clotting time. Um, we don't use the partial thromboplastin time for a reason I'll tell you. And in some institutions, which um, I think is interesting, and I worked with various degrees uh, 
an evolution of the heparin protamine titration, we can do heparin protamine titrations to look what the heparin level is. It's an online point of care device. The anti 10A is what we use often, especially in pediatrics for ECMO uh, for a multitude of reasons, but you can't really get that quickly, and it's critical that we get our test point of care test. Thrombin times have been used for a lot of different reasons. It's never really applied in heart surgery, although they've studied thrombin times, and there are other tests that have used. So why do we use the activated clotting time versus the partial thromboplastin time? The PTT we use for ECMO anticoagulation. We use it for valvular anticoagulation. But the reason we don't use it for uh, extracorporeal circulation, cardiopulmonary bypass, is because after you get a level, most of our therapeutic levels in an ICU or on ECMO are 0 0.3 to about 0 0.8 units per mil. For bypass, I showed you, you need a level at least two to three units per mil. After you get a unit per mil, the relationship almost is curvilinear. It's not linear. The ACT is far more linear at higher heparin concentrations, and that's why we do that. Back in the 70s, in the evolution of extracorporeal circulation and heart surgery, people would just give heparin, not really measure the ACT, um, and just sort of wing it. Uh, the ACT was really developed to better standardize anticoagulation practices. The ACT is fraught with issues, but I think any anticoagulation test is better than none, and the ACT is our standard of care. One of the things that I mentioned is that for anticoagulation to occur, you need antithrombin. I've done a lot of work with both purified recombinant antithrombin over many years, trying to figure out what to do with it. We still don't completely know, but uh, it's a very interesting molecule. It circulates at the second highest concentration, just about third highest concentration. Um, in the body because it's very critical that we modulate thrombin, keeping it local, keeping it at the vascular endothelial level. The endothelium contains thrombomodulin, a very potent receptor for binding thrombin. In fact, there was a big sepsis study just finished looking at recombinant thrombomodulin, and there have been multiple sepsis studies looking at antithrombin as well. And in fact, in Japan, they use it for DIC. Again, a very interesting molecule with a lot of different effects. When you send an antithrombin level, you get percent activity. A normal percent activity is about 80 to 110, 120 percent. This corresponds to a unit per mil when you're dosing. This corresponds to 15 milligrams per deciliter and 2.7 micromolar. Fibrinogen circulates at about 7 to 8 micromolar uh, and prothrombin at an equally almost high concentration. Very interesting yin-yang response. But this is sort of just a little gestalt and a little perspective. What does antithrombin do? Antithrombin pretty much binds to unfractionated heparin, the higher fragments, to inhibit thrombin. Antithrombin is also required for low molecular weight heparin to work, but the small pentasaccharide sequence from that, from fondaparinox and from other molecules, selectively binds and doesn't inhibit thrombin. But it's just the way the size of the saccharide sequence that affects it. So one of the goofy things is that if you're on low molecular weight heparin, your partial thromboplastin time, your ACT is totally normal. And that's the problem that early days of low molecular weight heparin, we got into trouble. The coags are normal, but guess what? You're on low molecular weight heparin from the cath lab, and it caused bleeding, and it wasn't necessarily measurable unless you send an anti 10 level. So a patient who comes in bleeding, you're not, concerned, you're not sure why, always think about maybe sending an anti 10 level. A study that was done at Emory oh, over 30 years ago basically showed that in patients, normal patients, your levels dropped about 40 to 50 percent during CPB, and it takes, as I said, two to three days to recover. In some of these women with bigger, bigger dilution, um, it drops even further. And one of the interesting things is that if you're on heparin, uh, it drops about 20 to 30 percent. Clinicians extensively use the term, well, this patient has heparin resistance. Well, the word is not really resistance, but it's really an alteration in your heparin dose response. And part of the problem is despite what everybody says and despite what our perfusionist colleagues tell us, nobody really knows what the right ACT is during cardiopulmonary bypass. I can tell you, I think I know what the right anticoagulation level is, but Different things that affect the ACT are problematic. Um, there's a 
really interesting study done over at Texas Heart back, oh, many years ago, where it looked at monitoring versus not monitoring, routine dosing versus chasing ACT, and showed no difference in outcomes. The concept of an ACT of 400 to 480 seconds comes from six primates on bypass, and that sort of has persisted. Say things enough in medicine, it becomes gospel. But um, there are different ACT systems that have evolved over the years. There are multiple causes of heparin resistance. Um, and uh, hi, are you waving to me or telling me five minutes? Okay, can I have seven to eight minutes? Thank you. And there are other things that, remember, antithrombin improves heparin response. Some data we showed, if you're not on heparin, using equivalents of 300, 400, 500 units per kilo, um, the ACT response really sort of flattens off. But if you are if you were on heparin therapy, where your antithrombin drops about 30%, to get to that magic 480 can be very difficult. And one of the things we showed some years back, if you give the equivalent of about 1,000 units of antithrombin, you can improve your heparin response and get a therapeutic ACT. If you're on heparin pre-op, you drop your level about 20 to 30 percent, something to think about, and almost all of our patients now are on some degree of heparin. A lot of things affect the ACT, and you have to be really careful. For instance, the patients come from uh, a scenario where they've got a fibrinolytic TPA, there's no fibrinogen, you put blood in the tube, it doesn't clot, because these are all clot-based assays. Same thing occurs for PTT. Um, if the patient's hypothermic, it affects your ACT because you have to warm the blood. Um, high platelet counts will actually cause hypercoagulability as well as high fibrinogen. So there are a lot of different things beyond antithrombin that affects your, um, that affects your response. The other important point is that when you reverse, and I'm going to talk more about this in bleeding tonight, but um, the lowest protamine dose is critical. Too much protamine is bad, and it may contribute to coagulopathy. And one of the interesting things, just to sort of finish up, to remind you about the problems of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Remember, HIT happens. Basically, um, it's an immune-mediated disorder where you generate an antibody to platelet factor 4. Platelet factor 4 is stored in the alpha granules of platelets. When platelets get activated with bypass, they degranulate their PF4. It goes to the surface of the platelet and creates a new antigen, a neoepitope, that the antibodies form. When the antibodies form, it aggregates platelets, and it causes activation, clot, and other adverse effects. Traditionally, it's observed about five days or plus. Um, your platelet count drops to less than 100,000 or 50 percent, depending upon your starting level. Traditionally, it's five to 14 days. But intraoperatively, you give heparin, the blood pressure plummets like an anaphylactic reaction. IgG can produce anaphylaxis think that you have an antibody and be real cautious. A lot of things in the ICU cause thrombocytopenia, balloon pumps, DIC, sepsis. So the drop in platelet count, intra-op, post-op, it can be very confusing. And there's a ton of papers written on thrombocytopenia in the ICU. But the important point, it's very prothrombotic. When the clinicians or somebody tells you the patient's hit positive, the question you need to ask is, what's the optical density and what was the assay used? Because there are different assays. The gold standard is the functional assay called the serotonin release assay. For instance, everybody gets IgG antibody just about after penicillin, but they don't get IgE or they don't get IgE to the subtype that cause anaphylaxis. Very common with platelet activation, especially in orthopedic surgery, cardiopulmonary bypass, where you have titers of antibodies against this PF4 complex. But it's only when you reach certain critical optical densities that it becomes an issue. A very cool study by one of the hit gurus, both Ted Workington out of Canada and Andreas Greniker, who I actually collaborate with in the ISSTH, done a lot of this work. What he showed is you're, op you're, you're positive, and most of these assays turn positive at 0.4. 0.4 to 1 optical density, you have less than 5% risk of true positivity by the serotonin release assay, a functional assay. 1 to 1.4 is 20%, 1.4 to 2 is 50%, and greater than 2 is about 90% on the IgG-specific assay. The ACCP guidelines basically say to use an alternative anticoagulant. The alternative anticoagulant, most studied 
off-label, but it's, it's a lot of data supporting this, is bival. For cardiopulmonary bypass, it's a one milligram per kilo dose with an infusion of 2.5, which is basically about two to three times, or about one and a half to two times the uh, cath lab dose. And in the pump, remember, a 50 milligram priming dose. Before you come off, stop the infusion 15 to 30 minutes. You can't reverse this. If you have renal failure, uh, it takes a long time to get rid of it, and you can bleed extensively. Careful with your flush solutions. Think about ultrafiltration. In your cell saver, don't use heparin. Uh, think about citrate. But again, there's also interesting data that the WashU people have published as well as um, the Duke colleagues using plasmapheresis before. You give heparin, and then if you need another anticoagulant, you switch to bivalerin or argatroban, direct thrombin inhibitors. So the take-home messages are, um, for cannulation, to sort of summarize, uh, most clinicians, and this is based on surveys, 300 to 400 units per kilo. I prefer the higher dose. Usually there's five to 10,000 in the circuit. Um, think about what your goal ACT is. Probably a reasonable number is 400 to 40, 80 seconds. The word is heparin resistance. It's probably an alteration in your heparin dose response. Rule out other hypercoagulability causes, high platelets, hyperfibrinogenemia. Um, maintain, if we'll prolong cardiopulmonary bypass time, think about fixed dose heparin or think about keeping a constant level. The ACT with being cold on bypass with low fibrinogen can be greatly prolonged and it doesn't correlate to your heparin level and I think you need a level of at least two units per mil. When you reverse, um, think about, well, I think most clinicians overdose with protamine. The half-life is an hour. If you're not using a heparin protamine titration, think about starting with a half of your initial heparin dose. If anybody wants to know why, we can talk about it, but excess protamine's bad. And if you're hit positive, during uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, bivalerin is, is an appropriate alternative. However, the first time you do this, if you've never done it before, make sure you talk to other people because the drug persists for a long time after. If you have renal failure, it's hard to get rid of the drug, and there are a lot of other interesting issues. So thank you for the opportunity. Talking about coagulation and hemostasis is kind of like talking about uh, love. Everybody talks about it. It seems like only a few people really understand it and I continue to try. Thank you very much. <laughs>